Hello, hello, okay, hey, what's up? Uh, not sure if we are live yet, apparently so. This is weird talking without headphones on. I just have this mic right here. I think the mic levels are okay, forgive me if they're not. This is gonna be kind of a just a raw recording, largely improvised from this list of topics that I want to cover uh, for a friend of mine, sort of my protege, and a couple of other people that also that I sometimes uh, guide in this sort of thing. People who are interested in getting started or are already getting started in cybersecurity. And uh, of course, that's the most exciting time when you're still exploring exactly what it is you're going to explore. Um, anyways, these are the topics that I intend to cover. Um, I'm going to call this a cybersecurity starter kit, but it's not really a kit. I just realized that kind of implies it would like come with stuff or anything, but no, it's just me talking. Um, so uh, anyways, um, me, I've been doing this for about 20 years. It's really been my whole life and I've been all across the um, sort of a flat uh, landscape across the breadth of the industry, um, you know, all the different parts of it, the uh, engineering part, uh, like compliance part, uh, standards, guidance, documentation, corporate security, red team, blue team, all that stuff. <clears throat> As you imagine, you might be after you've done this for a couple of decades. Anyways, um, and I might reflect on how that's changed. I've been thinking a lot about how that's changed over the last few years. Probably most recently, I'd say there's less of an emphasis on being able to code than there was originally. Originally, we didn't have a whole lot of tools and a lot of the tools were very specific. So a lot of the use cases were very specific. Um, you might you know, have a couple of scripting languages under your belt so that you could crank out tools really quickly to do a specific task. Um, for a, like a one-off attack or analysis of data or something like that. Um, that's a lot less necessary now as there are a lot of tools and stuff which we'll, we'll get into. Um, still, however, um, there's, I, I do believe there still needs to be an understanding of code and how programming works and uh, how code works in order to kind of envision your uh, target and think about the let's call it the geometry of its attack surface. Um, to understand that, you need to understand how programs work and how software works and anything. Maybe I'll go on more about that afterwards. Anyways, these are the topic areas. Um, <clears throat> item one, start looking under the covers and I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, item two, I dove into this a little bit just now, that things that you do still need to know, uh, basic technical aspects that you really should be so familiar with that <clears throat> that they, they are second nature to you, like swimming. Um, and then going lower down the stack, uh, you do still need to understand TCP IP for a variety of reasons. Uh, even though, I mean, these days it's unlikely you're going to be involved in, you know, actually hacking any stacks or looking for that sort of, those sorts of vulnerabilities or dealing with that sort of thing. It's all mostly very high level now at this point. Um, still, you really do need to understand it, especially IP addressing, because it has a lot to do with how networks are broken up and how things are hooked together, as well as routing, speaking of uh, hooking things together. I don't think you quite need to be, a lot of the lower down stuff, you don't really need to be as much of an expert as you have had to be in the past. I mean, I have held the job title of network security engineer um, before, so for a role like that, obviously need to have really intimate understanding of those protocols and how they work um, and such less so now in fact um, <clears throat> I would say maybe for the past uh, almost decade my applicate uh, at least my focus has been largely application level stuff so application security specifically web application security but also e even beyond that it rarely gets down to the level of the operating system um, with the exception of misconfigurations and stuff. That's not really quite hacking. Um, <clears throat> okay, the next item is uh, uh, ways to practice and study. I put this in this order. I put practice first uh, because I think actually doing stuff is probably the best way to study this kind of thing. And I'll talk about some resources on that. 
Uh, next, a bit about tools. This is, you know, I got to say, like ninety percent of these two items here. <clears throat> sorry, sorry. Ninety uh, percent of the, uh, you know, I mean, there's plenty of fantastic uh, tutorials and stuff about getting jump started, getting a jump start in cybersecurity out there. <clears throat> there are many, so many, and they will mostly focus on these two uh, areas. Uh, you know, resources for study and things like, uh, you know, try hackney and things like that various activities you could get involved in and then the basic tools um, so uh, but obviously uh, I would be remiss if I didn't cover those two areas so we will get into that as well also hacker culture which I think is really important to become involved in um, which is a weird thing to say uh, for someone who is a largely um, uh, isolated socially type of person and in fact you know most nerds uh, kind of are um, so it is kind of weird to say that there is a hacker culture, but there is. Um, and uh, I think it's important to engage it. Actually, a lot of the research comes from, uh, from out of hacker culture. So having a finger on the pulse of that is important. And I will get into that as well. Uh, okay, so first topic, start looking under the covers. Um, let me get over to a window here. Uh, okay. Uh, what do I mean by start looking under the covers? Actually, I already have this these training resources open. Um, okay. At a high level. I have to back up a bit, though. So, because uh, like I said, I've been doing this 20 years. It's really the only, it's the only life I know, actually. Um, I mean, when I started doing it, there wasn't even, cybersecurity was not a term. Uh, information security was the term, actually. Or uh, data security, which are still terms, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a term. There wasn't an industry. Um, there were like two antivirus, you know, companies. That's it. Um, so it has it has come a really long way, obviously, since then. And the way that you uh, bring yourself into it has changed a lot. Um, but at a high level, I would say it has always been thus that um, that there are kind of there's two worlds. Actually, in a way, there's almost three worlds now, but it's it's really still two worlds uh, of the internet and of technology at large. You've got your uh, <clears throat> you got your users um, on the outside, and this is how they this is how they what we're looking at right here. This is how they see the internet. Okay, this is the internet to them. This and Twitter and all that other stuff. This this is what it is to them. I mean, like how this stuff happens, they don't really know. Uh, they don't need to know, and that's fine. You need to know. You need to know what's going on here and how this works and what a browser is. I mean, this is just a piece of software. What makes it so special? Uh, at, you know, like what differentiates it from, uh, I don't know, paintbrush. Like, what you know, like this is a program too. How come it doesn't do this kind of stuff? Uh, so paintbrush is a standalone program. This is a client server program. This is the way we used to describe it. Anyways, <clears throat> what I'm saying is, and, and I said there's three, but really it's still just two. Oh, look at that. I'm like tripping the mic levels really bad. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, it's really just uh, it's really just two. There's the uh, users and then there's the nerds. So you are stepping into the realm of the nerds now. And, um, and this is not a, an acceptable uh, view of how the world works. Okay, you need to understand how things work. Uh, over time, you might have started looking at these up here, these little location bars, even as a user, and may have, you know, begun to see this <clears throat> as an inkling of what's going on under the covers, so to speak. And that's good. That's where we're going. So if you are the kind of person that has this sort of awareness and wonders, like, what's this number? You know, like, what happens if I change this number? Stuff like that. We probably broke something. Um, it probably just went to a different Actually, this is probably a, an advertiser or a visitor ID or something like that. <clears throat> Point is, if you're that kind of person, you find that sort of thing interesting, you do want to know uh, <clears throat> how it works, and you're curious about the man behind the curtain or person behind the curtain, um, then this is this is where you end up. Um, <clears throat> I was going to say, like, actually, I realize now maybe most of the newer generation uses all of these resources largely through their phone now and uh, standalone applications and are not even aware of any of this infrastructure and how any of this is working, um, much less <clears throat> much less the fact that there are entire realms of uh, internet 
computing that are taking place beyond this HTTP uh, TCP model and all that sort of thing. All right, let's take a look under the covers. Get into your browser and um, choose uh, view source. There's going to be uh, like an option for choosing to view the page source in your menus or something like that. Um, go find that. That is left as an exercise to the reader. You can press Control U in most of the browsers. Or you can do this. Uh, you might have uh, looked at this before. If you have not looked at the source of a web page before, uh, then um, welcome. This is going to be your life now. This kind of stuff, okay? Pages and pages and pages, screens full of incomprehensible stuff. Uh, just get used to it. <clears throat> this is one of the items on my list. Get used to the fact that there is going to be a tremendous amount of stuff uh, at first that you just cannot possibly comment. You can't know all of this. Well, I mean, I do, because I've been doing this for 20 years. But you're not going to know all of this. Almost nobody knows all of this. Um, what all exactly is all of this about? What is this doing? You know, how does it work? All of that. <clears throat> this is where you're going. This is going to be the next, this is going to be your life for the next few decades, okay? Is, is you know, looking behind the curtain and eventually living behind the curtain. Uh, so this is HTML. This is what all the web pages are made out of. Uh, it, it used to be really easy to talk about this. Um, let's see. We'll do a simple. We'll do a simple uh, HTML document here. Um, it used to be very simple to uh, to talk about these web pages. You could maybe take someone to Yahoo.com and show them Yahoo.com. Uh, oh, look at it! But now the it's all become extremely extremely complicated. Um, that doesn't mean it's too complicated for you. It, it's it's just that it's it takes it's going to take longer. Um, to get into it, that you know, to understand how these applications work um, than it used to. And I'll tell you, it actually, um, <clears throat> the ways in which it has become incomprehensible are no longer important for you to understand. Uh, so, for example, what did I just do with that page? There's new aid. Ah, oh, this will do. All right, so. For example, we were just looking at the source of this page. As I said, there was a time, I'm going to be old man, old man river now. There was a time when all of this was pretty easily comprehensible. Well, actually, this front page isn't too bad. Um, when all of this was fairly comprehensible, you would look at the front page of yahoo.com and you would basically see it in here. You would see the contents of yahoo.com uh, pretty it would be pretty easy to ascertain how this became the contents of yahoo.com. Nowadays, stuff become, has become a lot more complicated. Um, <clears throat> web pages will, like, like this, will put up a basic uh, sort of skeleton, you know, of the, of the site, and then the rest of this content is all loaded dynamically. It, it's gotten complicated. Um, so, so looking at this, as I said, you you get used you're going to get used to and you need to get used to looking at, at viewing the internet this way. Um, this is the real internet. This is how you should see it. Okay, you don't see it like this. This is for users. Okay, this is for nerds. Um, <clears throat> and uh, but you know, looking at this is not really any longer going to be a very actionable way of of learning how a uh, a web page works. So for that, you will want to you know, learn some basic HTML. And I'll probably include some links somewhere along in this video, maybe in a subsequent edit uh, that points you to some stuff like that. But in short, uh, it, it's basically all like this. So there's these there's these tags. These are called HTML tags. Um, are they called tags? I think they're called tags. Uh, <clears throat> whatever, thingamabobbers. Um, and there is a way to indicate that this tag, don't worry about what it does yet, uh, starts, this means it starts right here. I'm using air quotes, starts, right? And this means it stops. This means the tag stops when there's a slash. See, there's a slash. So no slash means it starts. Uh, slash means it stops, right? And it doesn't matter if they're uppercase or lowercase. And, uh, but take it easy on everyone's eyes uh, and do it lowercase, please. <laughs> um, and, and it's actually, I mean, you'll notice like in this production page right here, 
so real world production page they have a little bit more you know like they have this stuff and you know you can see there are some arguments over here actually so these tags can also have little <clears throat> technically it's called a value um, but uh, we can call it a you know it's a parameter so so we're saying this is you know we're saying the same thing we we're saying before but we're adding this other stuff here um, and there's gobs of these different things that you might find included in other tags uh, but you don't have to get into that yet um, so I've, I'm going to take this out for now just so that it visually looks simple um, so again I'm typing out a basic web page right now right so as a matter of fact this is how I wrote my first resume was uh, in actually I was in Vi um, <laughs> I just wrote my first resume in HTML by hand uh, back in the day so <clears throat> there we go there's test.html um, you're like what is that all there is to it uh, yeah that's that's all there is to it that is a web page right there okay it, it says hi mom it's not a very exciting web page obviously um, we could do other things like here we'll put this here's an image right here we'll put this image over here right under here this is how you would do an image like this and we'll go back and load the thing and you'll see that our cool new web page now has an, someone else's slogan logo on it all right so <clears throat> again that's that's behind the scenes okay this is what this is how the internet works behind the curtain and this is what you'll need to understand uh, I'm not going to go further into HTML I will be pointing to some resources to use uh, for that purpose uh, and so that's it that was my first point is to start looking under the covers okay if you go to some website and you're like hey I wonder how this website works or you go in here and you do a search for um, where's my cursor and you do a search for a uh, one duck egg uh, which I recommend you do um, and you're like hey what is you know like how does this uh, how does this work like how does it look it put the thing that I typed in it put it over there like how does it how does it go about doing that you know um, go check that out um, and I did show you how to open up the source of the page but I also want to point out uh, Chrome's uh, developer tools you can press F12 or choose more tools uh, developer tools um, I, there are similar functions in pretty much every other browser and don't sleep on uh, dev tools it is tremendously powerful I have to tell you like honestly 99% of the time for the first part of my whatever kind of hacking I'm involved in um, and, and you know blue team stuff um, I, I use Chrome dev tools a lot I usually don't have to pull out any other tools until until the point where I'm like okay this is definitely a thing and there's definitely a thing that I'm doing and I know what I'm doing and it's going to be a focused effort for a while then I'll, I'll move out of dev tools but you can get a lot done within this and again this is you know it's going to be overwhelming at first you're going to look at stuff and go whoa what's all this stuff that's that's fine get used to that okay you are a, you're a submarine engineer now you know you're a rocket engineer you are not just sitting in the passenger seat so there's going to be a lot of uh, you know uh, like uh, uh, tubes and gears and mechanisms and wires and it's all going to be very complicated and don't expect to understand it all at once it just you could but you can do it in little pieces uh, another thing I want to show you about dev tools uh, instead of just opening dev tools you can also uh, select a, an element on a page like this I'm right I'm right clicking here with the mouse second select an element on the page <clears throat> and choose inspect and uh, with some some you know, um, limited success sometimes it misses but most of the time it will take you directly to uh, where in the uh, source of the page that element resides uh, it can be a little complicated when it's generated programmatically on the fly some other stuff your mileage will vary etc etc right <clears throat> so this is this is where the phrase one duck egg was entered into there um, I mean and you can even start to experiment with uh, what with what how modifying things might might change or I'll give you another example let's say we want to look for one one duck egg uh, 
or this weird string for some reason. I don't know why we'll do that. We'll, we'll find this out later. By the way, this won't work because it's new egg. They've been plenty tested. Uh, and we get, oh, well done, you guys. Um, and we get this instead. This was not the example I wanted to give. I was hoping it would spit back some filtered version of that string. But instead, they detected that as a um, really sloppy, ham-handed uh, SQL injection, um, which and they're correct, actually. But uh, let's let's try this instead. They should filter this out, probably. Okay, there we go. So I'm just going to look for one duck egg, and it is angry at me. That's so weird. Uh, as I might have gotten blocked from new egg <laughs> like all at once. <laughs> Uh, that happens. Um, actually, interesting. It will not perform a search for that, as I think the deal. All right, I'm getting off track. I don't know why this thing won't search for me anymore. Uh, let's just search for hard drive, or search for one duck egg. Oh my God, they totally blocked me. All right, well, they'll probably remove. They, what they usually do is they'll set up a block for like it removes itself in a certain amount of time. Funny thing is they're still advertising to me at the same at the same time. Like, cool, I'll take this. Oh, I can't get to the site. Um, so, actually, I'm not currently working on new egg, so it's not a big deal. Okay, so start looking under the covers. Don't uh, get yourself blocked by new egg. Um, looking for, but I'm in the real world, by the way, I would never have sent anything so sloppy. Um, that's not usually how you do that. Okay, item two. Wait, did I say everything about item one? Yeah, all right, item two. You do still need to know this stuff. I was talking before about how things have gotten much more high level and you don't really need to know quite as much as you used to uh, back in the day when uh, I was a youngin. But um, <clears throat> uh, you do still need to know some stuff. Like, okay, like when I was a kid, um, when I was a kid, I mean 20 something. So we're talking like 2000. Um, uh, this is how we learned stuff was with the RFCs. Um, actually, that's not the right one. This is 2616. No, it's 2616. All right. So RFC. <clears throat> you should still read these, okay? Uh, they're really technical. Uh, here's one at rfceditor.org, which is weird. I think this is just an rfc.org. Um, speaking of the speaking of the uh, man behind the uh, curtain, in this case, it usually is a man, actually. <laughs> But not always in it, and uh, it will not always be. But often the men behind the curtain. Speaking of the men behind the curtain, uh, this is these are the men behind the curtain uh, right here. This is where all of this stuff comes from. This document was written in I don't know when this was, was written. Uh, ninety nine. All right. This was published in June nineteen ninety nine. This is the uh, RFC. RFC stands for Request for Comments. Don't worry about why it has that word it just doesn't it doesn't mean anything it's a technical standard really so <clears throat> this is a request for comments number 20 uh 2000 number 26 16 2616 uh published june 1999 by uh people you would recognize like tim berners lee uh who i believe just recently died i, I think maybe if not sorry tim tim berners lee anyways the, this guy is, if you look uh, if you look up in uh, Google or Wikipedia, you look up who invented the internet, they'll tell you Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and back in my day, this really is where we learned this stuff because there wasn't YouTube and tutorial videos. There was just RFCs. So if you wanted to learn how uh, HTTP worked, you would go to RFC 2616. And there's a bunch of others. They usually involve several you see what i mean so it says that it's been replaced by these other documents other rfcs uh that also extend and explain the this one's about http 1.1 authentication um this one is about additional http status codes we'll get into that a little bit later um <clears throat> i was going to say so so if you do want to understand http you know obviously you go to wikipedia http and you read that whole article right and you're going to go to some uh, hacker training resources that I'll talk about later and you'll read all of that article okay but somewhere along the way and I do recommend fairly early that you do read the uh, at least you know high level scan the RFC in order in order to understand you know like how these things were put together I would say that like okay look if you're gonna be an engineer 
uh, you know, like a site reliable reliability engineer, or um, I don't know, you build web applications or something like that. Uh, this is sufficient. So, like understanding this, everything that's said in this Wikipedia article, you know, probably is sufficient uh, to do that. I mean, if you really have internalized all of that, you know, you're comfortable like like you would be comfortable swimming or something like that. But for a hacker, okay, for the hacker mindset, this is not sufficient. Okay, because you need to understand this document is explaining how HTTP uh, is supposed to work. Okay, um, it's going to explain how it works in a best case scenario. Like this is what we, I, if you, I mean, if you go, you know, actually, if you go to uh, Wikipedia bank vault. I'm just curious. I've never done this before. I wonder what a bank vault, an article about bank vaults uh, is about. Uh, okay, here's an article about bank vaults on Wikipedia. It's about the design, manufacturing, uh, some document some document standards. There's a bunch of standards uh, and future. There's nothing in here. <clears throat> there's nothing about in here about circumventing the security controls of bank vaults. Okay, it's probably not even inferred in here. Uh, I was noticing I had some resistance standards. This is useful, actually. Okay, so if if I were a if I weren't a hacker, and I were a bank vault hacker instead, this is the this these bullet points are what I would be looking for, because they're saying that it has to be resistant to uh, certain stuff. Okay, so it says right here that like. Um, it, it's con considered to have failed of uh, such and such if a breach, uh, it's, you know, they have a measurement for what is considered a breach, 96 square inches. That's good. So this is me learning to understand not how this thing is supposed to work, but what the failure conditions are. So like where the flaws are likely to be. Like what are the, um, uh, okay, like if you look at like a, uh, you know, like a football player and they've got, you know, all this padding and stuff like they have a lot of padding around this crotch area. You know, if I were an alien, I, I only saw one of them, I would assume that's one of the areas to target because there's all these controls on it, right? <clears throat> Maybe there's a better example, but I think that's a pretty good one. So anyways, the same way, in the same sense, this probably doesn't go too far into what can go wrong with HTTP, which is what you need as a bad guy, as a bad person, sorry. Not, and I don't mean bad person. See, I think the phrase bad guy works better than bad person because bad person sounds like you're actually bad. And bad guy, we all understand as a mnemonic device to indicate someone acting uh, on that side of the, you know, of the scenario. Um, so, but anyways, if you're, if you're going to think with an attacker mindset, um, you need to understand, you need to understand it in whatever way suits you, but that is focused on not the main, um, not the main flow of how things are supposed to work, right? So this document just explains how HTTP is used to connect uh, client applications, that being a web browser, to servers and stuff like that. Um, it's not really going to tell you much, probably, on how how those things fail and where the weaknesses are and how you would think about it from an attacker's perspective. So that's where these historical documents come in really handy. I, at least the reason I'm introducing them to this conversation <clears throat> is because I already have, I already have this historical background, right? Cause I was there, like I was there when these things were put together. I was there when these things were published. Um, <clears throat> I was there as, as, you know, uh, as, you know, was, um, Mosaic, that's the one of the earliest web browsers. As Mosaic, you know, uh, added JavaScript support as all of these authentication mechanisms and SSL and all this kind of stuff were bolted onto it. And I saw how they were supposed to work, right? And so I know where the mistakes are. And I know where they, when you, when you hear someone, <clears throat> maybe if you hear someone announce their new product and they say, oh, it's an automatic, uh, I don't know, like dog sitter and it has a camera and a microphone. You know, like a, <clears throat> so the, the regular users, they, they see that and they think, oh, great, I'm, I have a dog, uh, you know, like I'm going to get one for my dog. And that's fine. That's what the normies are for. Okay, but you're behind the curtain. You're supposed to look at that and think, it has a microphone and it 
and it has a camera? How does it transfer that data? How does it secure the transfer of that data? How does it secure access to, there must be some sort of ways of controlling these things. How do you set the configuration for these cameras and microphones? How do you configure things? There must be some administrative interface. How do they control access to the administrative interface? You get it, right? So we're, we're thinking about things from a totally different perspective. And as I said, I have this historical background already, but for new people coming in, I they wouldn't have that, right? So I'm not sure where else you would get that except for accessing, you know, that insight through these historical documents. Um, so, and again, like, a, you know, they're deep, they're complicated, they're, these are technical documents. Um, and so, you know, as I said, like, take this recommendation with a grain of salt. Maybe you can get that insight through another means. Um, but basically all of this is describing, you know, how, you know, how the websites and the web browsers uh, communicate and now the, how the, you know, web services and uh, applications, apps like mobile apps and stuff, how they communicate and how they change, uh, transfer things back and forth. Anyways, all right. So that was historical stuff. What did I say about that? All right, so you do need to understand HTTP. That said, um, this uh, Wikipedia article, I'm sure, is great about it. Uh, along the way, you will probably find, you know, you'll find links to other things that will be of great value for you. Uh, like, for instance, the OSI model. This is a model, right? Uh, just like um, um, Monty Python says, you know, it's only a model. Um, but uh, it, it's a model to help you think about how, uh, I would say, like, the main reasons this is useful is, is it will help you organize uh, in your head your understanding about the technologies involved in all of this. All of this, when I say all of this, I mean all of it. The, the whole shebang, or the internet, uh, the, you know, the, the Chromecast, the mobile phones, it, it all, this is all of it now, okay? And it is a model. So, you know, sometimes you will be like, <clears throat> I'll, sometimes I'll hear from like a technical recruiter and they will ask some of the silliest questions like, you know, like what, where an application resides on the OSI model. It, it doesn't, nothing resides anywhere here, okay? What this is, is a, um, it's a conceptual framework that has been used by people to understand it and also to design it. So that means that like Tim Berners-Lee Lee and the other uh, engineers who work on the RFCs, when they're developing an application or a protocol, this is the model that we're using. This is, you know, sort of our, um, uh, you know, platonic ideal of how the internet and its applications uh, will work. And so, I mean, it doesn't map exactly to everything, but you get the basic idea. So for instance, like this application layer up here, I hope it's recording the mouse cursor, but application layer up here is where you would consider the web browser to be. So the web browser is is doing the, actually the web browser and actually kind of the application itself too um, on the other side. Um, you know, it, you, as I said, this is the where the, the top layer here, top layers are, you know, what users are accustomed to interfacing with. They don't really know about this other stuff, this transport layer, like how does the data get back, sent back and forth? Uh, you know, the le network layer, how is it transferred among networks, you know, from my house network to uh, Imperva's network, you know, or Google's network. How does all of this get transferred all the way across the, you know, world or, or whatever? You know, data link, like how does your, um, you know, network interface actually connect to the wire, the, you know, well, in this case, it's actually Wi-Fi, but even that is connected at some point to a, a physical uh, cable somewhere. Anyways, so this, you know, this, the, they're trying to sell me something. Um, <clears throat> so HTTP, just read this article, read other stuff about HTTP, um, and along the way, expose yourself to the OSI model and TCP IP. Uh, DNS, I called out specifically because it's kind of a really important part of how uh, everything works. It's when you, because uh, when a regular user goes to, uh, google.com and they receive this uh yeah this is google.com remember we we live behind the curtain okay so for us this is google.com 
I don't care about what it looks like to regular users. Um, I mean, what does that even mean? That uh, it actually Google.com is actually this, these addresses right here, and this other stuff too. It's complicated, but it's it's these. That this is Google.com. It's got an it's got an address just like your house has an address, and um, uh, Newegg.com has an address. Okay, uh, it's it's got a couple of different addresses, different kinds of addresses. It has different addresses for its mail than it has for other stuff for its email, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an, an important part of your uh, understanding of how things work behind the, you know, behind the curtain. And so DNS is also another thing that you need to understand at some point. Oh, look, I went to the IP address and uh, I got um, Google.com. I think they're giving me that ad because I went there by IP address? Weird. All right, <clears throat> okay, so learn HTTP and DNS. Uh, again, as I said, a lot of stuff. There's gonna be a lot of stuff, right? I mean, you've just <clears throat> peeled back the, you know, peeled back the paneling on the wall and, and are exposing all of the wiring and the plumbing and the cabling and the uh, infrastructure, you know, within. It's going to be a while before you could just look at it and know what everything is. Oh, like 99% of it for a long time is going to be just mystifying and don't be distracted by that. So just, you know, get as much of a handle on HTTP as you can. And when it starts to get to the point where, you know, uh, you're trying to understand how a TCP sequences are derived and stuff and and it's a little confusing that's okay just back off and you know it'll come in time and go to other other stuff so html javascript okay uh as i said you know they used to back in the day <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of old man uh old man river talk here um <clears throat> as i said back in the day um <clears throat> you know, there weren't there weren't YouTube tutorials or anything like that. And there were precious few books about this topic, as I like to uh, recall, re, um, recount to people <clears throat> when I was in college. Uh, the security was just a chapter in the back of the Unix administration handbook. All right. So if you took a Unix administration, which I did. Um, it, in the back, they would be like, oh, here's some security concerns, <laughs> things that you might want to be concerned about. Now, I mean, it's entire books. Um, so uh, anyways, back then, you know, to understand like how you might attack a website or something like that, um, you really had to understand how the website worked yeah, or how the application worked at a very, at a very low level. Um, and there wasn't anyone to tell you how to do that. So uh, all of this, the, see this stuff right here that we're looking at? And this is Google.com. And as I said before, there's going to be gobs and gobs of this stuff. I, I, I hope it doesn't seem dismissive when I say, again, don't worry that you're not going to understand all of this right away. Okay, a lot of this even now intentionally is gobbledygook. Like this, a lot of this stuff has been encoded in such a way that it's been either either done so to save space and transfer time and to optimize things or sometimes even specifically to obfuscate it so that we, and so that it makes the job of someone like me who's trying to understand how it works, you know, very difficult. It, it, it does that on purpose and we can get into that way later. Um, so, but again, don't, don't be freaked out by this. Just get used to a life where you spend a lot of time surrounded by things that are like, it, just like mind-bogglingly complicated, okay? And resist the urge, which I know you have, if you're a nerd, resist the urge to want to understand absolutely all of it, okay? And you will understand absolutely all of it, eventually, in about 20 years. Um, so for right now, uh, just focus on, you know, the, the like, you. it's okay, is what I'm saying, to gloss over a bunch of this, okay? To go like, okay, well, we're not here to understand what, what all of this down here is doing. It's probably nothing, by the way. It's largely about f like fonts and layouts and responding to user input and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's Most of it's about that. Some of it's about other stuff. 
um, but we don't need to know all of that. Oh, look, here's my email address. <laughs> yes, you can email me there if you want. I don't care. Anyways, <clears throat> point is, there's probably some other tokens in here too that I should be careful about exposing. <clears throat> but, um, all right, where was I going with this? What, were, what was the topic we were just talking about? JavaScript, right. All right, this is JavaScript. Uh, all of this code in here. Remember I showed you the HTML before and we know that this is HTML and the rest of this looks like HTML and here's some HTML and then there's this. And I'm like, well, that doesn't look like HTML and you're right, it's not, it's code, it's JavaScript. JavaScript is, uh, even though it has the word Java in it, it, has nothing to do with Java except that it was made by the same company. But um, <clears throat> it's, you know, it's a programming language that is used pretty much um, I've just realized that that's not really true anymore okay it does run on server side stuff but you're not going to do it for server side stuff probably you're going to use it for um, you're probably not even going to write it um, but you're going to encounter it on front end interfaces like this this is what a front end interface is and all of this this whole thing that we're looking at here this is a front end use in user space uh, front end interface right okay this is what I was talking about this is user land here Okay, this is Nerdland, Userland, Nerdland. Um, <clears throat> so, anyways, uh, all the all the stuff to handle all the stuff in Userland to make it so like when I hover over this, it it you know there's a little user interface bling. Oh look, I hover over that and it it does this thing. That's happening by JavaScript, right? In fact, look when I hover over this, it it changes the the words right to a bunch of different stuff and. I just hovered over it and it says, I'm feeling curious, I'm feeling artistic, I'm feeling lucky. This will probably prove me wrong here. Oh, look, and here they are. Uh, feeling stellar, feeling curious. You get, you get what's going on here? So it's, it's in there, right? Like this is, this, is what's hap this is what's happening inside the walls. See, I'm feeling trendy. Here's where the feeling trendy part of that came from, right? Um, so, uh, why was I talking about that? Oh, the reason that we need to understand a, at least a little bit of JavaScript, and you don't need to be a JavaScript programmer, but the more you understand about JavaScript and just code in general, any programming languages, especially the ones that they're using for front and back end application programming, um, the more you understand, the better armed you will be to understand and attack service and to leverage what and to even to recognize what the weaknesses are because to someone who doesn't understand how how the application works right so like someone who doesn't understand how this little bit of functionality works this is magic right so you couldn't imagine where you might poke at it or how you might subvert it to do something that you want instead but if you understand that it's coming from this bit of code right here and you understand how you might manipulate this code because you understand how the code works because you've written similar code or messed with similar code, then you'll be in a position to mount an attack against it. As a matter of fact, what this is saying, first it sets a D, it sets a variable named D to the current date, and then it runs something from Google. Oh, this is a library call. Um, and it passes some parameters. And I think this is whole first part right here is to probably come up with a random number or select something random from this, um, from this list. And then there's an element on the page uh, called IMG, well, it's an image. Um, and they get a handle to it and the rest of this, I'm skipping over, they're checking some stuff to make sure like a layout is correct and then it does a function uh, it sets the variable to all of these it sets a variable called PMC to all of those strings to all of those words we were talking about a string by the way is just more than it's just one or more characters like the letter F or something so along like a sentence or a couple of words or even one word or even one character is technically a string um, so this, this sets this variable to this long string with all of those little random things that we saw. Um, 
and somewhere down here, obviously, it chooses one of them at random. I, I assume that's what it's doing. Um, but you get the idea. <clears throat> this is why we need to be able to read this stuff so that we can figure out what we're looking at. I mean, maybe um, this has some sort of functionality that we can leverage for something. I mean, it doesn't in this case. But if this were a bank login page uh, or something like that, um, then, you know, this is, uh, this is where you would start getting an idea for where you might start attacking things or securing things. If your job is to secure it, you would start looking at it and going, well, how does this thing work? Are there ways in which this operates that it could be dangerous? What if somebody uh, had the opportunity to replace this string, you know, this list of things like maybe instead of it saying, um, you know, I'm feeling stellar, maybe it said that string that got me blocked from New Egg a little bit earlier. You know, like would that, if they had that capability, would that be a problem? Uh, in order to understand that, you're going to have to be able to look at this page and, and have some idea of what it might be doing. And as I said, this become less and less relevant because a lot of this stuff, honestly, is, is it's like crazy. Um, obfuscation is a big thing now, so a lot of this stuff you can't even read. Um, but parts of it you will. And uh, some of them, some of them actually will, you'll be able to find a tremendous, you will you may even find a tremendous amount of insight uh, into how they work by sometimes the most outrageous means. Um, I think I was looking at this one a couple of days ago. I'm not sure if it's still there, but sometimes you will even see things like comments from developers or maybe old code that they have commented out because it's broken. I know like, why Why is that broken? <clears throat> or sometimes like this might be called, instead of this calling web strips, maybe one of these is called admin scripts, okay? And you would have no way of knowing this existed because it's behind, it's, it's behind the paneling on the wall, right? So you need to be able to read this stuff and know what you're looking for. Um, actually, I, I think it might've been one of, uh, one of the scripts that this thing sources instead that I think was really telling it was the other day I was I was looking at this for reasons and uh, I found some bit of code in there that gave me a hint to something that was broken or had been broken and it turned out it was still broken um, because the notes said like such as such a you know like fix and the old code was still in there and the difference between the old code and the new code showed me what had been broken basically and so i realized that the the fix for it wasn't quite 100 percent complete in every scenario and that there was a way in which it was still broken um so all of that again comes from being able to look at this without your eyes uh, going cross-eyed uh which is going to require a familiarity with these uh, these sorts of things other programming languages obviously are very useful python's you know handy it'll be good for um you know, uh, making tools and stuff like that. Uh, as again, uh, well, we'll get into tools in a bit. Uh, JavaScript. Okay, APIs. How APIs work. How do APIs work? Am I still blocked by Newig? I might be. I know. So this has sort of like an automatic timer to block me out for a while, right, was the deal. Uh, so don't do that search that I did before. <laughs> Um, just search for one duck egg, which I always recommend you search for duck eggs because it could be duck eggs. Uh, it's a joke about the Marx Brothers. Okay, where were we? APIs, right. Okay, um, maybe there's a better way to do this. I should have, you know, you'd think that I would have thought about this before I started this because uh, I'm trying not to jump ahead too far. Normally, if I were working with APIs, I have tools that I use for working with that. And, um, you know, I, but I don't want to introduce that to the conversation just yet. Uh, this is kind of close. Here's an RSS feed. Um, yeah, this is kind of close. I mean, in a sense, this is an API. Yeah, it is an API, actually. Um, all right. So here we are. We're down here. Um, uh, so we're here in user land. This, the, God, that stupid video is annoying. Okay. So here we are in user land, right? 
Doopa doopa dirt. Userland stuff is my favorite stuff. Um, we're looking around. We're looking at products and stuff like that. And uh, then down at the bottom, there's also uh, this uh, like ads and stuff. I'm looking for the RSS feed. Uh, and it may not be in here. We'll look for it. Um, so um, a lot of this stuff. So let's say there are servers at Newegg.com. Actually, they're in the cloud. Who cares? Um, let's just call that Newegg.com. There are a bunch of servers, you know, rooms, very cold, loud rooms with many fans and many, many computers in them uh, that are serving up all of this content. Uh, some of it is generated from their own application services on the back end and databases and crap like that. They got all this magic stuff we'll talk about that you will learn about eventually. And then there's just some of this other stuff. Uh, and these things come from partners and other systems. Uh, if you log in, it will be communicating with other systems. When I choose this, uh, I assume there was a live chat thing. Don't they have the thing where someone's always, a bot's always trying to talk to you? Anyways, uh, if you, uh, if you engage in any of those, they will be interfacing with other systems. Um, and they will do this by means of an API. They call an application programming interface, so an API. Um, you, uh, actually, I just realized there's another way I should, I probably should have shown this is in the network tab. Okay, we'll do this. In the network tab <clears throat> of Chrome Developer Tools, that's what you're seeing down here in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, actually, first let me do this. So we go to Newegg.com. We go to Newegg.com and you already finished my thing for me. And we go to the front page <clears throat> and we press enter and it sends back this content, right? Done, right? End of story. Besides all the JavaScript running and all that kind of doodly. Well, not really. It used to be that way, way back in the day when Yahoo first started. Um, but it's not like that anymore, okay? Nowadays, there is all kinds of communications happening at the same time. So let's reload this page and rerun that uh, experiment. But we'll watch the activity in Chrome Developer Tools uh, Network Tab, right? So this is what's happening. You see all of these little... All of these little uh, lines scrolling by super fast. Again, this is more the gobbledygook. You'll just get used to this. We can't understand all this at once, unless you're me. I can, but that's for 20 years from now. Um, it's placing all of these requests to all of these different uh, resources and services and stuff. It's still happening, even right now, you see. Even as we are, um, you know, like we're already on the page. The page is loaded, right? And I haven't clicked on anything. I'm just looking around and scrolling down the page and look at all these things that are happening. It's placing all these, uh, all of these HTTP requests uh, to all of these different types of resources there. It's, it's fetching scripts and uh, metadata. Those are XHR files, PNGs, uh, you know, image files, uh, all kinds of stuff. And this is all happening, you know, without us even seeing it, right? So like normies don't even know this is happening. And to them, they're just sitting looking at a page. In reality, the, the website is doing stuff like the whole time. Um, and it's doing things like it, it pulled down this JavaScript right here. Let's take a look at this JavaScript. I'm going to open that up and we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, it pulled down this. Oh, I thought that was an image. Uh, it pulled down this image right here. Oh, because I have to see that. Right. Um, and I don't remember even seeing that image on the page. Let's remember. Like, so it's. God, it's a really terrible, grungy looking, what an ugly box. Why build that? Anyways, uh, oh, there it is, right? So it fetched that and then and then populated, these are the terms that they would use, uh, and then populated this little element on the page with it. And uh, uh, that's not a bad build. I mean, it's kind of excessive. Anyways, let's not get distracted by PC builds. Um, <clears throat> so all of this is happening, right? Uh, it it did this is one of them it placed this request right here to something called postback and these are all application <clears throat> api calls right so it's got an api called postback and actually this is called share through it doesn't have any response at least that we can see so this is the source of the, this is the that contents of that page uh, i'm gonna get to it in a second because Actually, I want to see what that thing that what that thing did. All right, here is 
Here's the Earl, uh, or Earl, sorry, Earl. <laughs> Here's the Earl that that, that, that uh, web page was placing at the time. This is the request. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's very interesting. Look, it goes to s.update.sharethrough.com. We didn't go to share through, right? We're at Newegg. But Newegg is, uh, as a client side application, is placing all of these requests on behalf of your web browser for you. To do what? I don't know. Um, stuff. Lots of stuff. There's so much stuff. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like it's calling something called postback and sending a bunch of parameters. Uh, this is probably marketing crap, honestly. Uh, it, a lot of times they're collecting metrics about um, uh, the things that they, you know, will help them market things or market to you. I mean, they collect stuff like <clears throat> if you mouse over this right here, I, I guarantee you it has just placed some sort of some sort of call to something like that. Yeah, probably in order to change the, the data about stuff that I'm interested in. Yes, they know where your mouse is. Um, so, I mean, like they even know like how long I spent with my mouse hovered over this, right? So that they can use that for marketing stuff. I don't know. Like, there's, a, there's another department that doesn't particularly interest me. Um, okay, so this was, oh, eh, I just, unfortunately, this was one of the calls that it placed and it turned out to be a particularly boring call. Uh, it's a call to YouTube's uh, embedded YouTube player which they clearly use on the page. Um, and that was just kind of happened to be something boring that I picked. So <clears throat> this is YouTube's embedded YouTube player in JavaScript. And actually, it's pretty readable too uh, by, by today's standards. Um, let's look at one of these other uh, URLs that I opened up. Here's one of the, one of the <clears throat> requests that it placed. This, this is, I mean, technically this is an API. Um, it is returning, they're using it for an RSS feed, but it is doing the same thing. You place requests to this and it returns data in a manner that is not intended uh, to, uh, to be presented directly to users. Obviously, this is not, you know, what you see as a user. And yet, this is the data that you see. So, for instance, look at the top of this. <clears throat> not the very top. This is XML, by the way. Um, but it, it doesn't matter. Like... You, it looks like HTML and, you know, you'll get used to seeing stuff like this. This and JSON, uh, JavaScript object notate, notation, are, are two of the more common data familiar, uh, formats you're liable to run into. Anyways, <clears throat> notice one of the top items here is $42.99 for automatic seven eggs incubator for duck bird chicken goose. <laughs> because what is a duck bird chicken goose? Anyways, <clears throat> um, because I searched for duck eggs. So it's giving me that stuff. Where is that? I bet you, if we look for automatic seven eggs, I'm just gonna look for automatic seven eggs. Oh, you know what? I'm no longer on that page is why. It's probably gonna give me the same. Yeah, there it is. Automatic seven eggs, right? Automatic seven eggs. So <clears throat> we're already building an idea about how new egg works, okay? It, it loads like it seems to load some basic website maybe that represents the top of this and perhaps the search interface and some basic layout <clears throat> and then it gets the actual uh, results back from this newaid.com slash d slash product slash rss api right um and in fact actually so let's see how that works i will show you so uh, don't worry about how I'm doing this just yet. You will have access to these tools as well. So this is the request <clears throat> that we observed the browser placing, right? That returned the data uh, that included the list of stuff. So we're going to place this request ourselves uh, with a tool in Linux in such a manner that we can res uh, observe the response that comes back. And there is the response that comes back. Uh, okay, this is the, the same XML that we were just looking at a moment ago. Uh, see, here's the 4299 Automatic 7 Eggs Incubator Smart Digital Hatch Tool for Duck Bird Chicken Goose. Oh, this is for hatching them. I thought it was for cooking them. <laughs> uh, 
Now this is for hack hatching. Why would I want to? It looks like it's made to put in your kitchen. Do people hatch eggs in their kitchen? Now I'm really now I really want one duck egg. All right. <clears throat> Anyways. So, uh, I mean, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because let's take a look at that request again. All right. <clears throat> yada, 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 RSS question mark, submit equals, and then there's, it says, submit equals E-N-E, -E, and then there's an and symbol. You'll get used to this. An and symbol, and it says, is node ID equals, and it says one. I don't know what that means yet. Don't worry about it. And then there's an and symbol. And then it says description equals one duck egg with pluses instead of spaces. I wonder what happens if we change this and we change it to say a two a duck egg, right? Like that. Um, and we'll take a look at the output. Uh, let's see. And up here it says uh, new egg title. I was looking for my search string actually. Oh, here it is right here at the top. So title, new egg, product list, text search terms, to duck egg, right? Which I know is grammatically incorrect. That's not the point. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so you get how this works, right? This is how, apparently, this is how the search works. It works through this little thing. So the funny thing is like, I just think this is funny. Um, let's see here. Yeah, that. I guess this is what I want. What I want to convey, okay? This right here. This is new egg, okay? This is new egg. The this RS product slash RSS API. This is new egg. When people are searching for such and such a new egg, this is what they're this is what they're using. Not that. <clears throat> not that. Uh, front end website you think that's new egg that's not this is new egg okay that that other thing it's just the face of it it's the way that it's all presented this is user space this is how users view the internet all right this is the internet to them to us this is this is the internet all right <clears throat> uh i'm not sure how long that went that was all about okay so actually i already the I already loaned my protege a book about APIs, I think. So, but there are some pretty good books recently. Uh, I think there's one from, uh, uh, what's it called? Hold on. Let me get it. I've got it. I'm back. Uh, it's called Hacking APIs by Corey J. Ball, uh, which sounds like, a, sounds like a fake name, but I'm going to assume it's real. I think I've actually shook the guy's hand before. Uh, from No Starch Press, again, Hacking APIs, No Starch Press, author, author uh, Corey J. Ball, a real name, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite good. Um, uh, actually, I, in my, both in my professional uh, in my professional venues and also in my off hours, uh, you know, bounty hunting stuff. I've had a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of success with APIs. In fact, I, at least a few years ago, I didn't used to mention them to people cause I wanted to keep them all to myself. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you can get quite a lot out of it. There's a lot to learn there. Um, and there's some great, uh, tools. Actually, I, I like to use a talent API tester uh, a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, let's, let's see if we can mess around with talent. We'll mess around with talent API tester right here. Uh, <laughs> probably. Actually, these are all stuff. These are all stuff that I actually have used in the real world. <clears throat> That's real world stuff. Yikes. Uh, okay. So anyways, so you can use this uh, to interface with systems like the one we were just talking about so like i was using curl over here and you will learn that later i'll get to tools in a bit this is talent api tester it's a uh, chrome browser plugin um and uh it's free so it's a it's another way to interface with this sort of thing in fact let me spend a couple minutes on talent 
uh, API test room. Uh, up here at the top, you can put in the uh, URL that you want to interface with. Uh, you can uh, change to the different methods like get post, all of that kind of stuff. Change parameters here. If I wanted to search for two duck eggs, right? <clears throat> and it has some, you know, like project management stuff so you can save these things. Uh, oh, oh, also another good thing is, uh, yeah, this feature. Look, you can, once you've muddled something out or you've got something working the way that you want, you can actually copy this and it will compose a curl command line for you uh, so that you could just paste it into Linux and it will work. This is also a good way for you to learn curl. So once you're like, hey, how do I do that thing that I just did, but I want to do it uh, in curl instead, you can uh, do it. Uh, you can use this to help you understand how those things work. Not so big a deal with get requests but with posts and stuff like that it can get a little um, it can get a little hairy especially for new users uh, so for instance uh, we uh, have been interfacing with this URL and I know that's a weird way to explain it but you, as you get more experience you'll understand why I use that terminology so <clears throat> we've been interfacing with this URL and we've just been using these parameters that it came up with there's a description parameter. Some people might call this a field or an argument. That's fine. Because there's a node ID parameter. We haven't messed with this. What happens if we change it to zero? I'm going to assume that one means yes and zero means no. Uh, oh, look, it still answered back. It seems like plenty fine. And we also get to see some other stuff that it's doing, like it's sending these cookies or, uh, or sends this other metadata that we may be interested in. There's a nice interface for looking at the XML or JSON if it sends that back. JSON again, JavaScript object notation. Um, we could add stuff if we want. What if I happen to add a uh, uh, here? I'll, I'll add a, a field to it, right? So it doesn't have an email field, but I'm going to add one. Obviously, you could do this manually, but this is a nice, friendly way to interface with things. Um, and we'll see how that works. I didn't like it, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Not happy at all about that. Um, but I wonder what happens if I put a second description field in there, right? Not for hatching. Uh, so we now have two description fields, even though it only took one originally. What's going to happen? I don't know. That's the cool part about being a hacker. I don't really care. Uh, too much if the safe malfunctions because it's my job to find scenarios in which the safe malfunctions. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> anyways, so uh, look, it actually took that. I don't know why I took it. And this is another scenario you'll run across. Um, like one of these, it may be ignoring uh, is what usually happens. This I can't remember if there's a technical phrase we use for this one, but it's a scenario you run into sometimes. Um, where it will take a parameter once and only process one of them. Actually, it took both of them. Look, it has two duck eggs, and then it has a comma, and then it says not for hatching. So, I mean, that makes me wonder a couple of things, like how many descriptions can I put? Will I get blocked if I put that <clears throat> SQL injection test in the second one? Uh, not for hatching. Uh, or <laughs> don't worry about that. That'll become, you know what, you'll think that's really funny someday later when you look back and they're like, oh, I get what was going on. Um, <clears throat> so I added the string that got, a, got me blocked temporarily from Newegg. I added it to the second incarnation, second instance of the description field. So there are two. I don't even know if we're supposed to have two. There's no way on the user interface on the front page of newegg.com to put two in there. Um, so, uh, or maybe there is, I don't know. Anyways, let's find out what happens. I bet we get blocked. We did not get blocked, and that is noteworthy, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. It's worth noting that we didn't get blocked because <clears throat> when I entered this before, it blocked us. So remember I was talking before about, 
about how if an alien was looking at a football player, he would note that there was a lot of padding around the crotch. And you could, <clears throat> and you, could um, you know, derive from that that the crotch must be, uh, you know, a sensitive area, a weak, a weak spot, so to, speak, so to speak, right? And this is something they kept me from doing before. So maybe I should consider that crotch padding. And yet now they've let me kick them in the crotch a little bit. I mean, just a little. That's interesting. Uh, and another thing you will learn is that when a hacker says something is interesting, it's, it's, not, it's not good news for the target usually. <laughs> so, oh well. Uh, I'm going to leave that tab open. I might play around with it more later. <laughs> Probably not, though. Actually, Newegg does have a bug bounty program, as a matter of fact, and we will get to that sort of thing in a moment. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Jeez. I only got through the first two. I really didn't think this was going to take so long, but... Um, you know, but actually I've run across a lot of fun stuff along the way, which is why. All right. <clears throat> so, you know, what? I actually am going to, I think I'll stop. <laughs> Should I, yeah, I'll just stop this video here and then I'll pick up, uh, I'm going to take a break for maybe an hour or so. And uh, yeah, maybe an hour and a half. And I'll come back at a three, maybe 4.30. Uh, so I'll come back at 4.30 and uh, finish items three, which is lower down TCP IP. We did talk about it a little bit, but I'm gonna dig into it some more. Um, some practice and study resources, uh, Chrome Dev Tools, actually I already did that, uh, but we'll go into some more tools a little bit, and uh, hacker culture stuff. So uh, that's good enough for now. I actually didn't realize I would be talking that much. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so I do need to take a break from that but uh, that was fun if you did tune in um, again I'm sorry I don't see the chat while I'm doing these but uh, if you did thank you for doing so and I hope to show up and as we say around here if you like it tell your friends and if you don't tell your enemies and come back at around 5 PST or 430 PST for the second half of this and I guess I'll just combine them in post uh, thanks a lot for tuning in bye bye